minimize any sort of loss. And again, the Dragons really helped them out in both game mm -hmm. one and two for their lackluster early game. What I really want to see is that if it's an infernal Dragon start, if Team WE can step up to the plate and play a proactive early game consistently. Well, let's see if we can finally get one of those infernal Dragons to pop up on Summoner's Rift here today. As we head into Champion Select for game number three, between Ime and Team WE this time around. Ime will be on the blue side, Team WE will be on the red side. Blue, team, blue side teams have reigned supreme so far in this best of three series. We have to see if that continues heading into the third game as Maokai Siva is going to be the first two bands that come out from mm. Ime with Alistar and Malzahar, the bands coming out from Team WE. Again, Team WE have been banning Alistair, Jin, and either Vladimir or Malzahar. So we'll see if the Jin ban goes through as their last ban or if they will prioritize the mid lane, especially because Sivir was taken off the board on the other side. Yeah, it has to be the Vladimir, but that leaves open the Jin as a very easy first pick. However, Shen's standing. Hecarim's also noteworthy. They have got options there. Braum as well seems to be this really big first pick choice. But you notice that if Braum's picked, then they usually now have a bard as a response. And so the choice is there for Ime as to which role they would prefer. Well, let's see what they decide to lock in. And they do actually opt to go for the jungle pickup with Hecarim being their first pick of choice. And that's actually really rare for teams. Majority of LPL teams are prioritizing either the support or the top lane matchup, actually. Shin being kind of the, the big reigning pick there. Um, but I believe RNG is the only team right now that prioritizes jungle as a priority pick. They just changed their strategy up completely, though, I mean. They come into the third game and they say, all right, WE beat us. Take everything they own. Instead of actually playing to a strategy that they want to compete on themselves. Well, let's see what Team WE decide to pick up as their next two picks. Braum is one of those highly contested picks. And Nah was not banned out in this game. It has been banned out against 9.7 in the past two matches. And he locks it in immediately with the Braum being picked up as their support of choice. No. Nah. Very good champion at the moment, actually. Hmm. It's been quite a standout, even when our LGD plays. Myron basically renames to Naren. Pretty much all he plays, but has the capabilities of hard carrying as well as being a tank. Has the capability of split pushing as well as team fighting. It's one of the m best multi-purpose champions, as long as you have a coordinated team. And there's one thing that WE does have, it's communication. Likewise, the confidence that you can blind pick NAR fairly early in your rotation and have decent matchups, meaning that uh, mm -hmm. Team WE can continue to hide their hand on what composition they really want to execute on. Yeah, denies the Trundle. As one of the big top lane split pushing threats. The Aurelia does do well into the NAR, however. And it really is up and available for Ime to pick if they choose to, but instead they lock in Thresh and Jin as their next two picks to round out their bottom lane. So there's that Jin that Team W were trying to keep out of the hands of Jin Zhao. Again, he's more of a utility-based AD carry, although he has been taking the hyper carry route this series so far. But Jin right up in his wheelhouse, it blends that hyper carry ability late game with the crits with the beautiful utility of his ultimate. And the real question past this point is how Mystic actually responds, knowing that he's into the Jin Thresh, one of the better pick combos. As much as he wants to play Ash. I would go Ezreal, because you need some kind of safety about you. Let's see if he does lock in that Ezreal pick. So we're waiting to see what Team W decided to pick up during their next two pick rotations. Already have their top lane and already have their support being locked in. The flip side, Ime still missing their mid laner and top laner, you would think, as Elise is locked in as jungle and Mystic is going to be playing his seventh game on Ezreal this split. Much more aggressive pick coming out of Condi as well on that Elise, so no longer sitting back and farming, but will take a much more proactive role in this game. And here it comes, Twist of Fate being locked in as the mid lane pick of choice for Aime. I feel like you have to do that now that you see that Condi's picked the uh, Elise. You can't allow Xie to also have that gold card as well as kind of his signature Twisted Fate. Yeah, I think he wanted it. Yeah. He definitely wanted the Twisted Fate. So that was not only an immediate lock in for Baimi, it's one of his better champions. It was a denial tool away from Sia, who can still pick a lot of strong champions in his own repertoire. Well, between the two mid laners, both Baimi and Athena have played seven games of Twisted Fate, the most out of any mid lane champion in the summer split of the LPL. And this team WE do lock in the Lissandra as their mid lane pick of choice for Sia. Hmm. 
Quite hard to gank Alessandro. Able to protect himself under the turret. Now Hecarim does enjoy ganking a Twisted Fate lane. There's one thing we have seen from Aimee in the past. Is that they usually lane swap when they have the Hecarim on their team. And they try and gank mid. But the difference with this team that they've got together is that Mitty's the jungler. It's not going to be a voidless. And so that gank may not happen. Should be noted also is that I may have a ton of mobility as we're used to seeing on their composition. So again, if they do initiate that lane swap, start pulling down those towers, it can open up a lot of danger zones for Team WE if they want to hold those towers or overextend for farm. Let's see if they can hold them to just that. And again, lots of pick potential for IMA, lots of team fight potential coming out from Team WE as we head into Summoner's Rift for the final time in the third match between IMA and Team WE. On to Summoner's Rift for the third match between Aime and Team WE. In that second match, we saw Team WE able to tie it up 1-1 between the two teams. To send it into overtime to see who is the second place team in Group B. Yep, absolutely right. It is a big match between both of these teams. There's a lot of disputes as to who not only the third best team in the LPL is, but the second best team in this group. So right now, as we take it all the way to three games, and both teams have showed what they have to offer, it does come down to one more. So do you get a chance to check in with the key? So Masteries, really quickly, nothing too surprising, but Jin and Thresh not opting to go for the double Thunderlords bot lane. Instead, we see Deathfire, Grass, as well as the Bond of Stone coming out from Thresh. Standard lane indicators. Looks that way anyway. See how they play it out. Also, Thunderlords for Condi. A lot of junglers would prefer Strength of the Ages to have some tankiness in their stat bar. But Condi, when he plays this Elise, has been notoriously aggressive with his movements. Rushes the boots of mobility, channeling his inner, M inner MLXG. Just gets everywhere. What a hard name to say, MLXG. MLXG. In, in casual conversation. Little spicy pot. Spicy hot pot. Spicy hot pot. Isn't it little? M L X G. Are you thinking of uh, Xiaohu? No, I'm just thinking that the X stands for Xiao. Nope. No. Xiang. I actually don't know. <laughs> <laughs> As like you said earlier, Rusty, it is going to be standard lanes that come out from these two teams. So we will see the lane between Jun Thresh and the Ezreal and Braum. Already, Zero Mystic being rather aggressive towards these two. Both AD carries took a camp at level one. And naturally, it's about how you play around the uh, Q cooldown for Zero uh, and how aggressive Road can be following that up. They do need to be very respectful about how close they stand to these creeps once Zero has the ability to stand behind them. Obviously, using that to reposition himself and find a cheeky auto attack to get the concussive blows going. Yeah, between an Ezreal and a Braum. If he's ever able to auto-attack you as the Braum as well as throughout that queue, you get stunned 100%. Mystic doing a good job so far with the help of Zero to keep both Jinjia and Road at bay. And the nice thing about Condi picking up this Elise, we talked about how he's taking a different responsibility this time around. Most of this series, he's been on kind of the farm-oriented Hecarim. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got a ton of kill pressure in pretty much all of his lanes. Naturally, a lot of that's going to come out of Shie once he's past that level 6, has the Frozen Tomb, and they have great 100-0 uh, to zero damage threat with the Elise there. But also even in this bottom lane, if Zero is able to get a hold of Jin Zhao, that all-in engagement... Let's see if they can take advantage of that one. Mithy now on his hack room is often to try and take down a scuttle crab towards the top side of the map. Amazing J did pick up Echo heading into this game to go up against the Nah. 
It's picked up by 957. Yeah, and Echo generally does not seen top lane anymore. Mm -hmm. Has been phased out. But one of the reasons Aurelia is good into Na is because you can burst him out. One of the strengths that Na then possesses in this matchup is usually that he can get to a point where he can still trade and get out in windows. But that's also the exact same strength that the Echo has. And so they're quite evenly matched. And Echo in general has just seen uh, a lot of longevity in the LPL past maybe the global regions mm -hmm. where he's kind of died out. LPL top laners still really like to fall back on them. And it goes back to this idea of how they like to utilize him in choke points in 5v5 uh, scenarios. Well, so who other than Amazing J to pick that one up is his most played champion. And also I make a couple lot of bans towards that Echo even recently. Uh, that the was teams have been dropping him. Quite a good ward from Bamey in yep. particular. Actually spots Condi looking... For the Hecarim, but there was no Raptors there. Connie was actually just wasting a lot of time looking for something, and there we go. It's not really time wasted when you walk that fast. <laughs> the mobility rush does mean that uh, Condi, again, probably looking to make the use of ganks as opposed to uh, 1v1 isolated incidents against enemy junglers. Still being fairly quiet between the two teams, both respecting each other quite a lot. That's, That's a big hook that comes out towards Mystic. The shield will come out from zero to stop the damage that gets traded out from Jin Zhao. As Condi now makes his way towards the top side of the map, pings do go out on towards the Elise, but Echo in a little bit of trouble here. Parallel Convergence looking to try and lock down the jungler and top laner and gets both of them. Awkward. We'll get stunned up in return, but Condi takes a <laughs> lot of damage for that one. <laughs> Everybody got stunned at the same time. <laughs> it's like time throws. <laughs> no one dies. Is it sad that I, I, my immediate reaction was, oh no, the stream. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's sad. We're still here for us, Karen. Nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was actually purposeful. Yeah, timed quite well by Condi if he's trying to get himself stunned. But once again, an early gank attempt. Boots of mobility means that you just saw him top lane. He's actually already his wolves. Probably be top lane in a minute as well. You never really know where he is, and that's dangerous. But it also does mean that he needs to be successful in these ganks, because obviously the mobility boots purchased as opposed to getting getting into those battle stats or even possibly looking towards a sight stone route if he wanted to go that direction, uh, do put him behind the clock. So needs to start getting the most out of this, I'm going to call it a snowball item. Yeah, or at least not unsuccessful, right? Because yeah. if it goes badly, then it goes really badly for him. One of the bigger winning features and... Something that WE are quite good at with this draft is pushing mid lane, trying to control where Bami is. Because if CA is able to roam, does still have teleport, or if he's able to just keep tabs and be available, then they also have the options of working around themselves as a duo. We actually did see uh, Bami trying to help out Condi in that, in, uh, not Condi, sorry. Help out the Hecarim in that situation. Midi, yep. Good old Fire Lolly. Condi and Sia whilst they're looking to try and get a deep invade towards that Raptor can. Cheeky pink, uh, cheeky ward, sorry, coming up from Sia was able to stop the Raptor sense that was smited away by Mithy as well. Like we mentioned earlier, still very quiet between these two teams. Tear already been picked up by the Ezreal as Mithy looking to try and make his way top lane. Does get spotted out by a ward, but here's Twisted Fate as well looking to try and lock down 957. They do get some damage down, but Condi locks down Bami with the cocoon. Suddenly there's Sia up on the top side of the map as well as a full out brawl as Amazing J looks like to be the first target. Sia taking a lot of damage in return, but both teams just escaped with slivers of health. And again, differences here is A, 957 didn't have Meganar available to work with, and B, your Elise is running around with mobility boots in a 3v3 scenario. That's what Rusty was talking talking about is if there's a counter gank scenario, it can go really wrong very quickly. Thankfully, it doesn't go too poorly because nobody dies, but that was super close and a lot was burnt in those situations as the immediate response is available, knowing that everybody on Summoner's Rift is not bottom. They're Quick, isolated. hit each other. <laughs> yeah. Now's the time. We can see what these... Um Two eighty carries have been picked up. Jin Zhao rushes his Swifty boots, and, and there's going to be a tear coming out from Mystic. As another good hook comes out from Rode, but Zero does the exact same thing and tells him to stand behind. Bro. I can say this with a hundred percent certainty. In my time scrimming over with teams in China, uh, any time that the jungler appeared topside, we used to call it the five hundred unit rule. If the bot laners within were within 500 Teemos of each other, they would automatically flash, and every single summoner spell would be used. Someone was dying. It's just like this. Killer instinct.
<laughs> How long ago was this, firstly? Uh, because this I was know what you're saying. Last December. Yeah. <laughs> I just love Timos as a unit of measurement. I still think 500 Timos is a little bit too much there, Frosco. Okay, it's like a sever auto attack range. If they were next to <laughs> if they made eye contact, they were flashing on top of each other. Five Timos. Yeah, five, five, teamers. five teamers. 500, I think you could cover some in this rift quite nicely. Whoa, Timos not that fat. I don't think 500 would get you halfway. <laughs> really? I mean, I don't have a Timo handy. That's like a scale there's, model. There's one here somewhere. <laughs> here comes Condi. It's an engagement. Bottom, the ultimate from Brom is not going to connect, but now Rose in a little bit of trouble. Here's a teleport to try and counter that Genka, but Rose can be the first target. Does get taken down by Elise. Amazing Jay is here looking to lock down Mystic. Condi, I mean, Mythi jumps straight on top of him, but he takes the brunt of damage in return, and Mystic fires off that final what? shot to take him down. Immediately, Condi blocks the bullets coming out from the Kurtical to keep him alive. Has Zero flashing forward, looking to engage. 957 is almost mega. Cocoon will not connect. Even the Lissandra is down in this bottom lane. But a big fight goes in favor of Team WE. Yeah, and still a dive threat's available as long as that Nas mega. They're going. There goes Sia. Locks down Bami. Paralock of Virgins might be able to lock them down, but Nah locks them into the wall. Amazing J will be able to help Chijia pick up a return kill, but he goes down as well. Condi now is on top of the Jin. Zero jumps forward, gets 957 to stand behind Brom, and Jin Zhao will fall as well. It's a delayed ace coming out from Team WE. And they played that so well. It was actually working just on the outside of the turret's aggro. The mistake from Aime was not being under the turret, using the turret's damage to help them, because that would have been dead members of WE. It doesn't work out as they planned. And they're not fighting over a powerful early dragon, but Team WE answered the questions that I had at the beginning of this series. Can they play an early game consistently? And with a resounding yes on the back half of that ace, they are in full and beautiful form right now. They're going to hit very early power spikes. Mystic right now, uh, Muramana and Sheen, super strong Ezreal at 11 minutes in this game. 2-0-2, two 15 CS up ahead of Jin Zhao, and Team WE in general are 2,000 gold ahead of Aimei. Looking very strong to start this one off. Every time we see Destiny being threatened by Baimi, you can also see Sia close behind looking to block him down. Speaking of locking him down, Condi now making an aggressive move towards the Twisted Fate. Knocks him out of the lane to start things off. It's a scary thing, but I'm pretty sure it just comes down to if WE are fired up. Like they get momentum from game number two. They find a victory. That was slow and calm. But the second they have momentum, it's accelerated. They get the confidence at least pick. They just start smacking everybody. I feel like it also goes back to Zero as well. We were talking about this earlier. Zero is just such a... He's quite a character, especially if you listen to all of his interviews as a MIDI. Yeah, MIDI actually getting locked down by C as well as the Cocoon fall off from Condi. They just delete him from Summoner's Rift. This is what we were talking about. Elise is one of the few junglers that has a 0 to 100 burst potential within the, uh, the Frozen Tomb. Real quick. Yeah, she skitters real fast. Yeah, that was uh, a lot of damage again. Big item. Advantageousness, -ness 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 -ness. That delayed <laughs> ace really <laughs> coming through. <laughs> English. Good thing you don't speak for a living. <laughs> Fish talk. <laughs> <laughs> Connie looking to try and take down this mouse and dragon. Jim was looking to try and steal that one up, but Team W secure even more advantages for themselves. And it's going to be another mountain that spawns onto Summoner's Rift. And for the first time this series, Team WE get the first dragon. That is bad news bears for IMA and IMA fans. You never want to see Team WE when they're ahead. Especially not when they can control the objectives pretty well. And it's not just a cloud dragon that these two teams will be fighting for. Means that these epic monsters and structures are going to fall down that much faster for Team WE when they get their hands on it. Just unluck, really. Yeah, I mean, a Rod of Ages is there for a Baimi, so they're starting to scale a bit on their respective side, but one of the big questions that we highlighted was the choice of Echo into the Nah, opposed to something like an Aurelia that can still take it apart and have a relevance with these teleports, get into these flanks. You avoid the setup time, which actually provides you an advantage in the matchup. Instead, by equalizing it, if WE are winning fights, then the Mega Nah is always going to be there. Whereas if I may are winning fights, then it's simply just going to be a stun as they teleport in. I'm going to try and start this fight off. Jin Zhao's actually going to fall down first. Sia picks up that kill. Another big pick will come out from Team WE. Lissandra completes the teleport. All me, boys. Picks it up with Q. Casually 
walks back to mid lane. And that has given Team W a 3,000 gold lead, so increasing that even further here in their match against Aimee. And it was just the mid lane teleport. He's a pivot point that doesn't need to use that as long as he has wave clear in this middle lane and a semblance of control. 957s is the important one. And that's still standing and present. 957 is pretty big as well, going for lots of tanky items to start things off. Condi gets a trinket down just to clear out his path towards the mid lane. Now moving on to see if he can take the red buff away from Mithy's side of the jungle. Baimi picks up his blue buff on the opposite side of the map from yeah, the he wants red. He's waiting for it to spawn. They're hunting. As soon as they see midi top lane, a play can be made bottom. Oh, never mind. Well, Their no. bot lane went back. 957 just went mega, so if he wants to go, Myth, he should be going when he turns into mini. Which 957 is now. The Hecarim is waiting behind the top lane turret. This is excellent right now if they decide to pull the trigger on it because uh, WE don't have anything on the map that they can counteract in terms of a play. Still here risky. comes the Destiny coming out on top of the Nar. Gets the double bounce to try and run away, but Mithy is going to be able to knock him back after the stun comes out. Actually, he runs out of time, has to use the ultimate. They still get the pick onto 957. And literally, there's nothing in response for Team WE. Twisted Fate is up in the top lane. The bot lane is uh, safely within Fog of War within inside their own jungle. So Team WE just have to take that one on the nose. Actually played beautifully. The assumption from CA was that the mid laner is recalling and then walks a very safe and prolonged way to get to that top side. They did do it a very extended period of time in advance, but because it pays off, very little is actually traded, as you mentioned. So Team WE looking to try and take whatever they can after that. Lots of damage goes on towards the mid lane out to turret. Condi cleans up Mithy's bottom side of the jungle return. They do, however, take down the bottom lane out of turret for their troubles. Close to two turrets for it, and still only a kill was gained on the top side. They didn't commit to pushing the objective of their own, so what was a nice kill actually comes back to hurt them for objectives. Condi is still waiting in the wings, making sure he's close by to see it at all times. Yes, to kill the TF. <laughs> Baby doesn't have any summoner spells. He's got Flash Frozen too. They could definitely go for this. There's the Claw coming out from Lissandra, but just instead look to try and take down this turret. So it is eventually two turrets for a kill that was picked up by Aimee. And now all of Team WE rotating towards that top side of the map. You see Zero and Mystic making their way up there, although spotted out by a pink ward. So Aimee should have enough time to group together some counter response. You would think so, but they <laughs> are very far away eject. on the opposite side of the map, and they choose not to fight this. Amazing J chooses to. <laughs> he is Zero. just one man. Zero is just on top of Amazing J. He doesn't care right now, trying to knock the top laner out of his lane. That's Team W on a mission to knock down all the outer structures on the map. And just in time for second rotation of Dragon, which will be spawning in 1 minute 30. So Team WE well in control of tempo and pace of this game, as they really have been this entire series. They certainly have. They will trade that for a bottom lane outer turret, or maybe even not after that True Shot Barrage, but obliterates the wave that was crashing on towards that turret. Four members strong now on the top side of the map, with Conti joining them as well. Means they get some good damage on towards this um, top lane inner turret. But they do have Road on the top side of the map now to try and defend this too. Now over pushing it, a Jin by himself will be enough to get them one turret, but going any further is uh, not that ideal. Team W in looking to brute force this one down and still maintain their 3 to 1, sorry, 4 to 1 now turret advantage. So overall, great map play coming out from Team WE in game number 3. Baimi's too scared. Again, there's just nothing they can do in response. They are trading the bare minimum, and it's always a negative. It's like Frost Guru mentioned earlier, Dragons will be coming back up shortly, 30 seconds until that one spawns, and like we saw, it's another Mountain Dragon. TNW can control this bit. Their structures are going to fall down even faster for them later into this game. And it's right on some pretty big power spikes for Team WE. Mystic in particular picking up his Iceborne Gauntlet off that back, so... Ezreal just waiting for his tier to stack before he's fully online with those two items. Mm -hmm. This is the do or die moment for Aimee. If they choose to fight this one, it's risky given those item spikes and they should be aware of this. They can sit back instead and choose option B, which is don't fight and never fight until we have at least two completed items. And because of the bleeding out that WE is causing, that's pretty risky. I feel like they have two scenarios here, like you said. Uh, wait it out until 
you catch up with some gold or catch up in item spikes, which they do have the potential to be quite scary late game, especially with that gen, mm -hmm. or just make picks and use their Twisted Fate and uh, long-range gen ultimate. Yeah. I think ideally it's actually around mid lane, but yep. it's so hard to do against the Lissandra. It really does come down to finding Condi, I think, and letting him be the one that gets caught out. But as long as Zero is working with Condi, there's no such thing. Well, they really did take their time. They cleared out as much vision as possible around the Mountain Dragon Pit. And have started this one up. Condi taking it out pretty low with the help of Mystic. With <laughs> Mystic shots. With the Mystic shots Mystic over the Mystic doesn't wall. exist. <laughs> It's going to be another Mountain Dragon. They'll be spawning on the Rift next. So potential of three Mountain Dragons for Team WE in Game 3. Yeah, that's great. It's Jin Zhao against Mystic. Shot. Now I can think about it. Did he name himself Mystic because he was an Ezreal main? Or was he an Ezreal main because his name is Mystic? What came first? I don't know. <laughs> Not a question that I can answer. Tweet at SpawnLol. <laughs> you know <laughs> he will know. Trust somewhere me. he cringed. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since I heard that one, Rusty. As Team W looking to continue their hunt for more structures, they move three members down towards the bottom side of the map now with Sia joining them as well. We're going to take down the bottom lane in a turret. Dark Passage actually being thrown back with there by Thresh, getting Amazing J to join with the defense of their structures. Structural defense is not an easy thing to do, though, against an Ezreal. And especially when you have a Braum to deny the wave clear that an Echo generally can provide. And especially when you have a Jin really is your only form of wave clear. He's now actually looking for Amazing J. Condi will land that cocoon and chunks him down to half his health. No response coming out from Ima just yet. Road is threatening for a hook. As even 957 is now moving towards the mid lane to continue this push. Team WE just need to be patient here. They're actually stacking up another pressure point in wave. Uh, 957 catching that one before he heads down to his team. So the siege is on. They're not backing away from this. Well, there's a hook. Not going to connect from Road. He's going to take a lot of damage in return. Puts down the box, but will still get locked down by Sears. Frozen Tomb has now a full force fight has broken out. Sears actually has to try and flash away from the damage. Mythi goes in, but immediately backs out. A big ultimate comes out from Amazing J. But Team WE now looking like they want to just retreat away from this one. Kurt's a call. Oh, no. Might be able to clean them up. He finds 957. Zero is looking to block. Jin Zhao picks up the kill. It's going to be the Twist of Faith that gets the return onto Zero. Mythi in trouble, though. As he gets locked out. Condi protobelts into the fight. Baimi has a stun card waiting and ready. Flashes forward for it. Seer threatening to go back in. I may turn around that fight. They pick up a two for three. Yeah, there was no way that WE could actually fight past the turret being taken. Of course, running low on mana and resources, they expended a lot of their efforts in just getting the turret down. So it was risky. And they don't exactly come out bad for it, but it was a lot worse than what it should have been. Risky and overzealous and it certainly does help uh, get Aime a lot of that kill gold back in their pocket to meet those itemization uh, differences and discrepancies. You see the damage dealt during that team fight. Jin Zhao, he had a lot to say in the back end of that fight. The curtain call really cleaning up 957 and almost was able to take down Zero with him too. Yeah, and unfortunately for WE, their target selection was just to get kills in general. They thought they were further, there, further ahead than they actually were. Using your Lissandra ultimate to lock down a Thresh doesn't win you a fight. However, still at the same goal lead they had before that team fight, which is 4,000 up ahead of Aimee. They were able to get down that bottom inner turret, which means all of the outer structures have been taken down for Team WE. The only the bases left standing for Aimee. And I'm still one out of turret in the mid lane, facts. We're now starting to move our attention towards the top side of the map, though. Uh, particularly that Baron, and I may need to be very careful about Team WE with this Baron, simply because they do have the Mountain Drake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we smashed really quickly. They have a lot of threats now, especially 957 with split pushing and his two completed items. Again, they've got so many tools to actually get them into this game. IMA's composition should have that same availability, but it feels like if Jin Zhao and Baimi aren't working together in mid lane, 
and Midi's getting a flank, then it's not ideal. And this is the thing. You really need Baimi and Midi to step up and to start setting up those picks in those 4v5 uh, scenarios. Well, they're looking for Road to start things off. Cocoon lands, even a teleport being channeled immediately. Mithi now in a lot of trouble as he gets locked down by Sia. 957 is trying to chase with almost Mega completed, and they just go straight back for Baron. But it's Team WE who end up with the pick when you have so much pick potential in Aimee's composition. It's a they're failure to execute. To this. Well, here comes the Destiny trying to get to Safe closer to the fight. 957 is Mega if he chooses to transform. They haven't backed away from this Baron just yet, so it hasn't reset and is getting pretty low. Macy J now looking to go into the fight. There's the Kurt call coming out. TW actually pretty low, but a Macy J falls, but we're going to use his ultimate. Mithy goes down next. Only Baimi and Jinjiao left standing. TWE still have control over this Baron. It's going to go down. They get the smite off as well. They had the Baron aggro that entire time, and they still won a team fight successfully. They just walk back to it and pick it up throughout this. That was incredibly well done. There has to be heavy criticism on Baimi. I understand that he is a twisted fate, and so it's scary walking so close into that team fight. but to sit on a gold card for so long and not CC anyone in that team fight, you need more from your mid laner. And unfortunately, I may not successful in defending that objective after the initial picks came off on towards Road and later Mithy. Team Navi now 7,000 gold up, only one outer turret or inner turret, sorry, left standing for Aimee, and it's just the base that will separate them. It's another Mountain Dragon that's coming up in 15 seconds. Team Navi could definitely take control of the pit and get that objective for themselves. There's a couple of uh, questionable itemization decisions here from Aimee across the board. Knowing that they're losing this game, the gold leader stretched out a lot more given the Baron that just got taken. But a Duskweight of Drakthar on that Jin. if you're ever in auto attack range of somebody, you're usually too close at this state of the game. That could have been something with the same armor penetration and slightly more defensive. Not only that, the completed Trinity Force choice from Midi, instead of leaving it at a halfway mark in a losing game, means that he does do a lot of damage to the fragile targets on WE, but they're no longer fragile. Game one and two, Dragon RNG was not on anybody's side, but now three <laughs> mountains and an Inferno is going to be spawning next, and Team WE have firm control over that objective at the moment. Looking to continue their push, 957 actually duking it out with Amazing J, forced to teleport get Kenny Mega. Mega in time, does get the Gnar off, he might be able to get the one-on-one -on -one down as well, still chasing on towards this Echo, who is fairly p fast. Has ult here. Gets nailed with the Ice Boulder and will be able to jump away and continue running away from 947. He's just wasting a lot of their time of uh, consolidating their Baron buff and trying to push for structures. So good on Amazing J, does burn his TP cooldown, but again, it's just about eating up that Baron clock. The TP cooldown will hurt a lot, though, for the next couple of minutes. Nah, doesn't have one of his own, but it's a lot closer to that of the Echo. And still the four-man threat that is capable out of WE is more than capable. You see how fast the mid lane inner turret falls down with the 30% increased damage to structures. Claw will threaten the engagement coming out for Sierre. As they're looking to continue pushing here, they still have 957 split pushing on the top side of the map. His teleport is almost back up and ready to be used as they wait and walk this cannon minion to just chip away at the turret slowly. And they're focusing a lot of their efforts towards sieging. Every single time WE try and take a turret, they commit to it. They try and out-sustain, they try and poke and push them away from the turrets. And especially with this Baron buff, there's not much wave clear available. Well, now they're looking to try and go for that and engage. Claw does come out, forces the box out of row, but Sia doesn't opt to follow up. The turret's going to fall down, and Aime looking to desperately defend against Team W, but it seems like there's nothing much they can do against all the power being thrown at them. And the wave is pressured top lane, so they're going to make a very quick and easy rotation to continue the siege, or possibly just fall back and eat up all of the jungle resources. Let's see what they're going to decide to do. For now, it is going to be pushing out that top lane after taking the mid lane inhibitor. Getting it, or pushing it as close as they possibly can, can towards that turret. Baron is down now, though, so no empowered minions to help them out with the push. Yeah, and this is the same thing that they ran into last time, pushing their luck a little bit too far. But with 957 now grouped, working on that Mega, they might still be strong enough to actually go. CF flashes in for Jin Chao's able to take it down with Mystic's ultimate. Now slowly, Aimee are dropping like flies as Mithy was the next target for Connie, is able to escape with a sliver of health. 
This is looking disastrous for Iron Man at the moment. See, it dies to a turret as Bami picks up the kill in the back lines of that. They're trying to take down seven. this turret, but it does get locked down by the hook. A double kill comes up for Bami. Suddenly, TWE are the ones that are trying to run away. Mystic's in trouble. Gets shut down by the Thresh. There's the Destiny coming out. Zero going to get taken down. Mythy's just chasing them. What an absolute disaster for TWE. You Almost on cue. <laughs> Overstayed their welcome. Decided to commit to a fight when they are... Stayed for one more wave. Lost the Baron buff, so lost that minion to control. And there it is again. And uh, yeah, the, the big thing is lost the Baron buff, lost the creep wave control. The fact that the creep wave uh, dispersed meant that the tower then got the 66% damage reduction. So when they tried to turn and burn it down before continuing the fight, it would no longer just fall over despite Mountain Drakes. They were seeing red. They thought they had the game completed when they won that team fight. But without the setup, you can't win every team fight. Almost looked like they're going to do just that. Now they are still 5,000 gold up ahead of Aimee. So a sigh of relief for Aimee after that initial team fight. I admire their zest, though. The immediate flash frozen tomb. <laughs> That's it. Yep. <laughs> That's all they had. Even 957 throughout that fight was trying too hard to hit a Mega Nar onto one target. Yep. He didn't get the target. He still oh has no. his ulti. You can see it on their faces, though. I don't think they're too displeased with themselves. Oh, Zia's has permanently Zonia's. Great. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, hopefully he uses it again during the next team fight. Reset that audio bug. Here he comes. <laughs> <laughs> He's here. <laughs> Disaster. Well, they're still looking to try and push down that top lane inhibitor tower. They did get it pretty low during that last team fight. So one final push should be able to take that one down. Because here's a Curzon Call actually coming out from Jin Zhao. Looking like he wants to just clear out the wave. A Brom just stands immediately in front of it, soaks up that. It's successful in delaying the game a little bit longer, though. As here goes 957, does get hooked by Rogue, They're immediately in. jump in, Thresh will fall immediately, amazing, Jay will get locked down, ults to get back to safety, the inhibitor is the target for Team WE as they try to poke that one down, and after losing a member in that initial engagement, Aimee can't fight back. Yeah, they're still looking forward, Aimee, trying to push WE at least out of the base, but now that's two inhibitors down, and a lot of control with that Baron and Drake available quite shortly. Bami had no mana at the start of that. He actually had to go back to base before coming back in. And it's things like that that actually separate winning a fight and losing a fight. That's why WE have lost twice, and now their inhibitor is gone for IMA again. I respect Bami's 4-1-4 scoreline, but I feel like he's just frankly been very underwhelming for this game right now. Uh, typically, we don't see much of a difference between Athena and Bami. And in fact, Bami should actually have a better repertoire with the team because he's been playing with these players longer than Athena has. Mm -hmm. Uh, but frankly, it's just been very hit and miss on this Twisted Fate. And we know that Bami, Athena, Twisted Fate's definitely in their wheelhouse. But I stand that it very much was more of a denial pick rather than uh, an execution pick for Bami here. Well, 957 now looking to try and take down the Infernal Dragon for Team WE. Make sure they clear up every objective they possibly can before pushing for that final inhibitor. Yeah, they're good to go. Actually, I'd do Baron first. They do have a minion wave set up down there. Amazing J also has teleport, but he's currently uh, a Bami, not an Amazing J. And so that Baron will be quite easy to look towards. With three Mountain Drakes, they can just kick it off as they please. Let's see if they do just that, because they are trying to get rid of as much vision as possible. Ward there, yep. just out of the range of it. Sneaky Ward is able to spot out Team WE. Trinket's even being used there, just to see if they've started the Baron. Playing the game. Just waiting there it for is. Vision control and they just pull the trigger, looking to try and take down this Baron. They do have... Deep teleport. Three Mountain Dragons and an Inferno, but there is that teleport coming in. Zero looks for the initiation. 957 going in, but doesn't have his ulti just yet. CF forced to ult himself to keep himself alive. But Rhodes already dead. Now Jin Jiao being jumped on by Zero. Amazing J trying to keep people occupied in the back lines. A double kill will come out for the Elise. Bami's now the one that's getting hunted down by Team WE. But they get the two picks and reset to go straight back to Baron. And it's not even 957's Nah that's bannable winning this game either. Mystic is doing so much damage. 
damage in these fights, and CA is just zoning with his Lissandra, keeping them busy. They're trying to stop this. Here's a Cursor Call. Zero's got the shield up to try and stop this. Mithy goes in for a steal, but it's Mystic that picks up the kill, as well as the Baron. Now Bami has to run for the heal. Gets tagged up by the Boomerang. Good gold card will stop them from advancing, but Frozen Mallet slowed him down. Not quite enough, but here comes the Claw. Flashes forward. Jin Jiao's in trouble. Gets taken down. CS still alive after the wild card, even. And now Team W have the eyes set towards Aimee's Nexus. There's going to be at least the two inhibitors that stay down, but the Baron buff to empower them. This should be enough. They flash forward. baimee has got a Dark Passage to try and run, but dies in the middle of it. Road does pick up a Salvage kill, but it's going to be the Nexus Taurus that fall. They're still looking to push. Amazing J is doing whatever he can to stop this. Road's going to fall down. The final Nexus Turret is the target here. And Team WE secure the second spot in Group B as they take down Aime 2-1. Team WE came out very strong in the early game part of this game, and that was the only weakness that if you look across that roster, you say, where do you make improvements? The early game, they stepped up huge against IMA, and they proved not only are they the second best team in Group B, but the second best team currently in the LPL. It's a big call to make for Oscar in, but I they have <laughs> just beaten RNG. They've now beaten IMA, who have been claimed to be the third best team. This puts them at least above fourth place. I have confidence that if Team WE continue to play in the form that they displayed in game three of this game and through their series of RNG, that they are actually a dark horse for this. It's a fantastic victory coming out from Team WE. Things look shaky in that first match and a little bit during the second match as well, but game three was a lot more clean, a lot more clinical from Team WE. Yeah, and it's about finding that early game lead. So once they get that, something that WE doesn't often get, they are able to close out games quite effectively. The difference between WE and a lot of other teams, let's use Aimee as an example, is when Aimee get a lead, they usually just start snowballing, they start diving, they start accelerating. WE play calm, they play around the neutral objectives, they get more and more gold incrementally, and then hit you at that late game. They're called 35-minute team for a reason. It doesn't even matter if they're winning or losing, if they have an early game or not, they try and turn it on around them. They're effectively a one-punch team. They wait till it comes down to a single team fight and they believe that they have the consistency to, ex consistency to execute on that. Yeah. And that's the beauty about uh, Team WE as an LPL team. Very few LPL teams have consistency. We make all this, this joke all the time about Invictus Gaming, uh, that EDG are the most consistent team that the LPL has really ever had. And, you know, even they still drop the balls, not getting to go to MSI. So the fact that Team WE late game are so consistent, now they just need to match their early game with that. And I kind of want to pull it back to what we uh, talked about at the start of this series. Team WE, their players have really been stepping up so far in the LPL, and they're proving it again here in their match against Aimee. I guess the biggest thing, once again, is probably Mystic and what he actually got accomplished in this game. There's a few changes in the draft that we can definitely highlight. The Elise is an example, but Mystic's just the air of consistency on this team. He's always doing his damage. He's definitely stepping up to the plate against all of these LPL AD carries that are world-class, and he's still doing his part. He still probably did over 30% of his team's damage in that last game. And we still saw them, you know, take it to 35 minutes, especially in Game 1 and Game 2. I like what you mentioned, Froskrim, which is, you know, they had a better early game, especially in game number three there. Aime, though, they look to try and change things up as well. We saw uh, Jin Zhao pick up the Kog'Maw in the first two games, did well in game number one, didn't quite do as well in game number two, and when they were able to pick up Jin in game three, it just fell flat on his face, it almost seemed. I'm not going to call Aime a smart team, but I will call them a clever team. Um, I think that they run kind of gimmicks in their compositions a lot of the time. We think about like that semi-global or global composition. Uh, they set a lot of traps with their vision. They're really about their support, their jungle synergy carrying them. And so I think that the plan that they had, Rusty covered it very well of you know taking the Kogma against Team WE because you are sure that it's going to go at least past 35 mm -hmm. minutes was clever. Uh, now they just need to be, again, I hate to say it, consistent. And we came into this match also seeing um, how global picks are going to be heavily contested from these teams. I may like to run it. They did run it in games one and two to try and protect the Kog'Maw and also use it for their pick potential in those games. We also kind of mentioned how Twister Fate is a big contested pick between these two teams. We didn't see play games one and two. Game three, Team WE pick it up and... Uh, sorry, I may pick it up and it just wasn't enough for them to use it for victory. 
I guess the same thing could be said about the Bard. We came into game one, said Bard's probably going to be a big contested pick, but it was only seed once. However, it was to success in the second game. So these teams have got their mindset on certain drafts, certain ways that they want to play the game out and what their victories look like. But they're also picking and banning away from their opposition. And Aimee's strategy in this third game was so heavily revolving around denying WE. It doesn't work like that. Well, let's take a look at the MVP for that third match. It's going to go to Mystic on his Ezreal. 7-1-11. 90% of his team's kill contribution and 30% of 37% of his team's damage. Which is still ridiculously high, especially for an Ezreal. I mean, uh, Ezreal, he does ridiculous damage late game, but you have to hit those skill shots. And so many players, even at the professional level, are unable to match a consistent damage output on this champion. Uh, but Mystic, I mean, taking after his namesake, is just beautiful to watch on Ezreal. He certainly is. And once again, proving to be the big playmaker for Team WE as well the most MVP performances in his team, and he's top five in the LPL for MVP performances as well. Yeah, he's definitely been a strong performer. Him and Zero have actually been coming together as a bottom lane duo, and they really have stepped up to the plate for what the LPL has to offer. Without that brawl, the Ezreal may not have lived time and again throughout all of these games. And just like we mentioned earlier, Team WE in general really stepping up as a team, all five players coming together, working well as a team as well to pick up these victories, especially as we approach uh, the end of the group, group phase for the LPL. And it really feels like Team WE are solidifying their identity, uh, identity a lot as well. You know, really good late game team, really good team fighting team. They're throwing a little bit of early game action in the mix of it too. It's now about development and Team WE are one of the few teams that um, you start to actually see that development quite clearly. You know, more often than not, they're starting to get these early game leads and make something of it. So it's nice to actually see progress. Whereas you look at the rest of the LPL and it's, you know, roster swap, roster swap, roster swap. At least Team WE, they have the consistent uh, talent. Now they just need to develop that talent further. Mm -hmm. They just need to... Uh, so the cool thing about WE is they... You mentioned this in the cast, controlled their tempo quite well. So they decided how, what pace they're going to play the game and tried to actually force IMA to play towards that exact same pace. What WE really should work on is increasing the tempo or decreasing the tempo to what wins them the game, not what just gets them to the 50-50 fight. If you hit Trinity Force spikes on your Hecarim in the jungle, actually try and make some picks with it. And I like that we mentioned, you know, the very solid, solidified roster coming out from Team WE. IMA on the flip side, they've been messing around with their junglers, trying to sub in a Voilist and Mithy, also trying to throw in a Athena and Baimi. We even saw a substitute, substitute sorry, in that third game against Team WE, which didn't work out quite well for them. They're still trying to figure out this late into the LPL, which is their best lineup. I don't think it's any surprise the top three teams in the LPL are EDG, RNG, and Team WE. And all three of those teams have one thing in common. They all have consistent rosters that haven't gone through pretty much any swaps. The only adjustment that you can make is Pawn for Scout, mm -hmm. and even EDG have gone back to just using Scout. So, I mean, everyone else swapping, rotating. Pretty much. We even see uh, lots of teams like swapping out their entire rosters and Victor's Gaming is one of those. Uh, <laughs> OMG. <laughs> OMG, another one. You're seeing about 20 different players at random times during the match. But just like you mentioned, you know, the consistency of those top teams really proving strong. IMA in general, they do seem like they're getting more of a consistent play style though. You know, they go a lot towards those picks. They try to do a lot early game, but we didn't see a lot of that early game potential from them in this series. They're doing what a lot of LSPL teams do when they get promoted to the LPL. They start really aggressive. They start as an early game team that lack either a prolonged laning phase or early team fighting to try and just completely take you out through individual skill. They're now starting to actually establish themselves as they stay in the LPL for a prolonged period of time. To get wins against teams that start to understand you better as time goes on becomes more and more difficult they'll draft against you they'll draft away certain things from you they need to actually find a strategy that isn't just good but wins them the games that's where i may really will shine usually in the semi-professional scene the skill discrepancy between individual teams and individual players is so much that you can just kind of brute force victories a lot of lpl lspl teams like rusty said will play very aggressive because they're used to just being you know the more talented rosters the better players when you start moving up into the professional circuit obviously you're playing against the cream of the crop and you can no longer rely on just your ability to press your buttons but how you think about pressing your buttons well, i think one of the last things we can really touch on here is you know we came to this saying this is the match for i made to prove how good they are as a team and although they got taken by, by team we they still put up a good fight in certain spots but 
just looked outclassed, especially in that last game. I may have been tested three times now. They came in a cross conference. They did well. A lot of people were hailing them as the third best team in China. And frankly, they had their first test against EDG. They failed it. That's fine. It's EDG. You expect them to fail. Everyone they then faced that. OMG. They failed that despite winning because it was a very close game. And this was kind of the last straw for me for Ime to prove that they're an elite team. They fell to Team WE. Yes, they took a game, but WE were in control this entire series. I'm sorry, Ime just aren't there yet. The big thing that I take away from this series, though, for Ime is that you can see the potential in yes. this team. You can definitely credit them that in a split from now, if they find consistency, if they find the ability to play to more than one strategy and open up their ability to win on Summoner's Rift, they will be a top three team. Well, they have come a long way, you know. First seed from the LSPL, now in the LPL. Third in their group at the moment, one game away from that second place. And have been performing well despite that. But it is Team W that do pick up the victory here today. 2-1 in that best of three series. But we still have one more match to come, so don't go anywhere because next up will be LGD, LGD sorry, taking on Vici.